Well, it's great to be back. And uh, who was here last time? <laughs> Not many of you. Oh, well, that's. Uh, well, I hope it gets better then. Guess uh, now it was five years since the last one. If you wait another five, I'll probably be carried onto the stage in a chair. So <laughs> I better do better and get back in a couple of years. So it's lovely to be back. And uh, last time I told you about our research on psychedelics. Uh, this time you asked me to do something even more controversial and, uh, and tell you about uh, why we should all be concerned to do something about drug policies. And uh, this is a topic that I'm uh, very familiar with because this topic got me sacked. This is me, by the way. This is how young I was once. This is me being sacked as government's chief drugs advisor by uh, the Home Secretary, the Secretary of State. And uh, the reason I was sacked is because I was reading from the book of cannabis, which, of course, is not something that you read here. You just use, don't you? Yes. <laughs> but in Britain, reading it is a very dangerous thing. And uh, because when you read this book, you discover that drugs like beer and tobacco are somewhat more harmful than cannabis and also more harmful than these strange chemicals in these little plastic bags here. And my government did not want to know the truth about cannabis. It wanted to keep scaring people and trying to get votes from old people by uh, telling them that uh, young people who smoke cannabis were wasters and losers. And I was saying that cannabis was actually less harmful than beer and cigarettes, and we should focus our attentions here and not here. But they didn't like it. They gave, I, then, uh, as I say, I got sacked. Now, of course, at that time, that was nine years ago, there was still some uncertainty as to whether I was correct or not. I mean, there was no uncertainty in my mind because I was a world expert, but in the government's mind, there was still possibility that I might be wrong. But then a couple of years later, uh, I was proved right by the greatest authority on drugs the world has ever seen, Mr. Obama. And, um, <laughs> and this was a remarkable statement. I mean, and it's um, a remarkable statement because for the first time in history, an American president told the truth about drugs. He said, marijuana is less dangerous than alcohol. And that, this is a unique transformation. The reason he said it, of course, was because in the USA, over uh, 200 million people at that point had access to medical cannabis. But it was illegal, and still is illegal, under federal law. And the feds, or the DEA, as you probably know them, if you've seen Breaking Bad, the feds were destroying pharmacies that were supplying medical marijuana because they were allowed to do that because they were the boss. And, uh, and that was actually going against the will of the people. So Obama said, no, I'm not going to allow you to carry on doing this. We're going to, if in the states that have medical marijuana, the pharmacists must not be touched by the DEA. So a remarkable statement. It stopped a civil war between the DEA and pharmacists. And more than that, it actually changed the whole uh, attitude of the rest of the world to America. Because up to that point, all drug policies in all the countries in the world, including yours, uh, had been made by America. And after that, it was clear that they could not impose American policy on Americans, so they have no uh, uh, legitimacy in trying to impose American policy on the rest of the world. So you can breathe a sigh of relief, Denmark. You can now make your own laws if you want, because the Americans won't go after you. Well, of course, and that was until Trump. And, uh, and cousins, now we have this absurd situation where, the, where cousins um, might, the Chief Justice in the States, might start to try to roll back that uh, legislation. We hope not, because it, there will be a civil war if he tries to ban cannabis in the States. But, uh, uh, so hopefully that's one thing that won't happen. But it was a, it's been a huge movement, and, and obviously you, know, you, you led that. I mean, Christiania has had a kind of liberal approach to cannabis for a very long time, so you're ahead of the game. And uh, that's why I speak here more often than I speak in America. <laughs> now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you through some of the biggest issues in relation to drug policy that uh, we all live under. As I said, uh, every country, in the, pretty much every country in the world, has complied with UN, which is US drug policy, for a long time. And there are many flaws in it. And it's biased. It's very punitive rather than harm being, looking at drug use as, a, as, a, a, as an illness. It's disproportionate. In many countries in the world, people are executed for possessing drugs, which seems a little bit 
in a rather excessive way of dealing with the problem of harm. You know, I mean, very few drugs kill you, but execution does. <laughs> it limits treatment and research. This is what we're going to talk about mostly. And also, it's hugely wasteful of money, and, uh, and it makes things worse. So the drug laws are extraordinarily bad laws. In fact, they're some of the worst laws that have ever been made. They're, they're, the drug laws stand alongside slavery, racial supremacy, and male supremacy laws as being the worst laws in the history of the world. They're unjust laws. But when we think about their impact on research and science, they are the worst. There's no comparable censorship of research and clinical treatment in the history of the world to compare with the problems, the hurdles, and the, 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 the disadvantages that the drug laws have uh, put upon the whole of the, uh, the world. Because 197 countries in the world have signed up to the UN conventions on drugs. And the ones that haven't signed up just don't know about them, so they just do, what, they do exactly what they were told anyway. So there's no, apart from the Dutch and you guys, there's no one has ever tried to break free from the shackles of the UN conventions. So you, sir, you saw in the uh, cartoon leading up to my introduction some analysis of this graph. This is a very famous graph now. It's a, a graph which uses the most sophisticated analysis we have of drug harms. To produce this graph, we took a group of experts and we worked out how many different harms there were to any individual drug. It turns out that any drug can, can produce nine harms to the user and seven harms to society. And then we took these 20 drugs and we scaled them all on these 16 criteria of harm and then we weighted the final scores. And in the end, to my surprise, to somewhat to my surprise, alcohol came out as the most harmful drug in the UK. And that is because of the size of the red bar. The red bar is the harm that alcohol does to other people in terms of road traffic accidents, healthcare costs, policing costs, domestic violence, etc. It's not the most harmful drug to the user. The most harmful drug to the user here was crack cocaine and crystal meth. But they're not so widely used. It's the, wet, it's the vast usage of alcohol that is the, why it's a major social problem. <laughs> And then, do we have the questions at the end? Otherwise, we go, yes? Yeah, we have, we're, I've got plenty of time for questions. In fact, I will stay all night. I will stay all night and answer questions until you fall asleep. But we're going to take the questions at the end because I should probably cover your arguments in a minute anyway. So, on this end, we have drugs like mushrooms, LSD, ecstasy, which cause very little in the way of social harm and, uh, and relatively less harm to the user. So that's the very sophisticated analysis, the most sophisticated ever done. We replicated it with um, 30 European experts, including two Danes, you'll be pleased to know, and, uh, and we came to the same results. And we've now replicated it using an Australian expert group just recently. So we're very confident that this, this, in Western countries, this, these, this is the appropriate analysis of the scale of drug harms. And if you then do statistics on this, you see there is no correlation between the position of drugs in the United Kingdom or the UN schedules and the harms of drugs. There's no correlation at all. Now that is very worrying to a scientist because the drug laws, the conventions, are supposedly based on evidence of harm and they're supposed to educate people about harms and they're supposed to help drive policy in the right directions to reduce harms. And that tells us, therefore, that the current UN conventions and the UK drug laws are actually, they're not evidence-based. And therefore, they're immoral. And an immoral law is a very bad law. And that then raises another question. Where does the dishonesty come from? You know, why do we not have evidence-based drug laws? Who is telling us that we should continue with this, this arbitrary set of regulations? And... Uh, the drinks industry is one of the major protagonists in this. Say no to drugs, that way you have more time to drink. And with the exception of this little free city, this is true for the rest of Denmark. You have no choice outside Christiania other than alcohol if you want to get intoxicated. Whereas here tonight, you can get stoned as well as intoxicated legally. And that's a very important choice because cannabis is less harmful than alcohol. 
But the drinks industry has been extremely efficient in eliminating all competition. In the 1880s, you could go into your local pharmacy and you could buy cannabis, you could buy codeine, you could buy cocaine tincture, you could buy heroin tincture, you could buy a whole range of different drugs uh, to deal with pains and distress, etc. And you could also go to your pub and buy alcohol. A hundred years on, all the alternatives have been eliminated and the drinks industry is the only one. And it's continued to perpetuate this myth that alcohol is not a drug, which is a, a complete falsehood. Alcohol is a powerful drug, which of course is why most of you have already taken some tonight. And then there's the media. This is a, a very famous... This headline refers to a drug called Mephedrone, MCAT, meow, meow. Legal drug teen ripped his scrotum off. Um, people say to me, is that English? And I say, I say no, it's sunnish, because it comes from the sun. Um, it's suggesting that someone taking mephedrone tore his scrotum off. We wrote to the sun and said, this is a very important side effect of this drug. Um, could you tell us about the case? And they said, oh, we couldn't, we couldn't do that. And we said, why not? He said, well, we don't know who it was. Someone just told us. <laughs> and these very interesting fictions about drugs, they're very powerful because people, people who want to believe that drugs are harmful, they will remember that. And they will go around telling people, don't you take that drug, my son, or you'll tear your scrotum off. <laughs> to which the son will say, what's a scrotum, mum? <laughs> But that's the modern day, that's the modern media, but actually things used to be a lot worse. And uh, these are the arguments that the newspapers use to get LSD banned. And they truly are beyond ridiculous. So here you see, uh, girl gives birth to a frog, <laughs> LSD made me a prostitute, LSD fed ape rapes TV actress. I mean, that truly is false news. And you'll see the interesting mixture, it's all about, it's about basically sex and drugs and not a lot of rock and roll. But those were the kind of fabrications that newspapers create, because newspapers are largely in collusion in, with the drinks industry. Most journalists drink excessively and they drink for free as long as they don't criticise alcohol. But then behind it all are the politicians, and, and, and this, this is the true... Uh, terrifying reality of why we have the drug laws as we have today and why the war on drug exists. And I, I just must read this to you because this is where the whole American approach to controlling drugs through war originated. It originated from the Nixon re-election campaign in 1968. This man, Ehrlichman, he was the intellect behind the campaign. And this is what he had to say. The Nixon 68 campaign had two enemies, the anti-war left, that's the anti-Vietnam war left, and black people. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing them both heavily, we could disrupt these communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. And that's why we have a war on drugs, because it was expedient for Nixon in terms of getting re-elected to try to undermine the, the anti-war movement and black people. And then Ehrlichman went on to say, did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. And the truth is that the drug laws that you lived by and that all the other countries in the world have by. They're all based on lies that politicians have told in order to get re-elected. And that's outrageous. It's dishonest. And you're all culpable for buying into the politicians. And scientists are culpable. And this is very sadly true. But here's a, one of my favorite cartoon. This is the Dilbert cartoons. Do they translate him into Danish, Dilbert? You don't need to, because you all speak such good English, don't you, anyway? So this is Dogbert, and Dogbert is saying to Ratbert, I need three bitter and unsuccessful scientists and a hundred lazy journalists. And the rat says, very good. 
And the next morning, Mr. Dilbert reads in his newspaper, did you know that toddlers thrive on pollution? <laughs> and you get lazy journalists and dishonest scientists together, you can find these kind of claims. Ecstasy causes brain damage, cannabis causes schizophrenia, LSD makes you mad, our drug laws are working. You can even get this kind of absurdity. Because if you pay scientists even a little bit, you don't even have to pay them a lot. Some of them will tell, will tell the tales to, to politicians they want to hear. And I would say to you that the science underpinning our current drug regulations is some of the worst science there's ever been. The science of drugs and drug harms is awful. Because most of what is invested in that science is money determined to find problems with drugs. In fact, under the, the current statutes of the American uh, National Institute of Drug Abuse, you cannot do research to show that cannabis has a benefit. That's not allowed. So everything is skewed to find harms. And that is not good science. And the truth is that many of the drugs which are illegal and many of the drugs around which this war is fought were medicines. Cannabis was a medicine until, in my country, 1971. And it has multiple uses. Ecstasy was a medicine for PTSD and Parkinson's disease until it was made illegal. Psilocybin has utility in depression, OCD, cluster headaches. LSD was showing real promise for the treatment of terminal illness and, and uh, addiction. And methadrone, the scrotum tearing drug, <laughs> was actually being developed as a treatment for depression and addiction. These drugs were either treatments or being developed as treatments. But as soon as they're made illegal, research pretty much stops. And that is outrageous. And I just want to talk you through the current status with the WHO, because I have been involved in the last few years in trying to get the WHO to tell the truth about cannabis. And this will hor horrify you, because your government pays quite a bit of money to run the WHO. And you need to know how they ignore evidence relating to drugs like cannabis. So I'm just, let me just talk you through cannabis, because it's the, most, the worst example. The last time the WHO reviewed cannabis as a medicine was before it was formed. The WHO was formed in 1948. The review of cannabis was done in 1934 under the League of Nations. It has never reviewed the medical value of cannabis since then. So it continues to say cannabis has no medical value based on a report that is over 80 years old. That report got it removed from the pharmacopoeias in many countries. I suspect Denmark took it out of its pharmacopoeia in the 30s, based on this report. <laughs> Despite the fact that 18 countries have now put medicine back in as uh, a medicine, the WHO has refused to review this report. And that's because the Americans won't allow them to do it because it's a legal drug in America, and the Americans tell the WHO what to do. But what is worse is that if you go to the WHO, as I did last year, and I presented them with a review that we did to the very highest standards. They define the standards of their reviews on the web. We did a review of cannabis according to their standards using some of the top experts in the world. I went there. And I presented it to them and said, you haven't had time in the last 80 years to review cannabis, but the good news is we've done it for you, according to your standards. Uh, would you like to put it on the agenda for discussion? They said, no. I said, why not? And they said, because we didn't contract you to do it. And they just tore it up. So we said, well, that's OK. Well, you know, that's, that's not, not a very mature approach, but you know, you're obviously you're allowed to make the rules up. But by the way, could we please look at the 1934 report on which you are based, basing your argument? There is no medical value to cannabis. And they said, no. And we said, well, you have to let us see it because you, know, you cannot deny access to, you know, my government pays to help run the WHO. We need to see this report. 
And they said, we can't show you it because we don't have it. <laughs> so the whole 80 years is based on a report which has disappeared, which they won't redo, review. I mean, it is outrageous. And, and it's, it's obscene and dishonest. I mean, it's, it's hard to get enough arguments against it, isn't it? And the other point to make is that these banned drugs are virtually impossible to research because the rules that control them for recreational use are applied to researchers. Now, again, you talk to the WHO and they say, well, no, we never said you can't research the drugs. It's just that we want to protect people from recreational use, so we just make it a bit more difficult. But in practice, working with these drugs through the current regulations is like being in a Kafka play. You don't know which room you're in, you know how big the building is, you have no way whether there's an exit or not. And no one has, almost no one, except a few groups like ours in the last couple of years, has ever achieved the ability to work with these drugs. And they say, well, that's not our fault, it's your fault. And we say, no, it is your fault, because you've created a burden of regulations which are just oppressive and unnecessary. And this is proof that the regulations impede research. So this, these graphs show the blue on the number of papers per year on LSD, and the red are the number of papers per year on magic mushroom psilocybin. And you can see LSD was discovered in 43, being made public at about 1953. Massive increase, loads of papers, over 200 papers a year being published on LSD. Most of those by doctors. Most of these funded by the US government. Up to this point here, when the drug was banned, the US government had funded 140 separate studies on the utility of LSD. Psilocybin was made a medicine in 1958, and many studies were done there. Since these drugs were made illegal, the US government has funded not a single study. In fact, no government in the world has funded a single study on LSD since then. So that's 50 years of no funding. And it's difficult to do research without funding, and that's why the number of papers have fallen off. So this is, this is censorship. This is extreme censorship through a combination of impossible regulations and complete lack of funding. If you're interested in that, that, that this as a sort of scientific challenge, I've written a couple of papers. This is a sort of major paper that looks at the whole history of the drug laws and reflects on a number of different drugs in terms of their treatment opportunities lost. Uh, this one is a more recent one. It's an easier one to read, and it's also free. It's a free download if you want to read it. But about 12 years ago, I, me and a couple of colleagues thought, maybe it's time to do something about this. If that censorship is so oppressive, someone's got to try to turn the tide. And so we decided to start working with psychedelics. So just a few words about psychedelics, for those of you who don't know what they are. There are psychedelics are drugs which come from a range of plant products. This is peyote mushrooms that make mescaline. There's magic mushrooms, some that make psilocybin. Ayahuasca being brewed up in the Amazon, where two plants come together to make a, a drinkable form of DMT. Amanita muscaris, much loved by northern European Siberians. Morning Glory, the seeds of which contain a natural analog of LSD. Ergot, the fungus growing on rye. And this is perhaps the most interesting image. This is an image from a Greek vase. It's 3,000 years old, and it shows a Greek noble person eating the ergot to get the psychedelic, and drinking wine. And that combination was much loved by the ancient Greeks. When the Jews started to get into the rye and the fungus started to grow, they would have their holidays. So instead of, go, as you guys go to Ibiza and take drugs, they went into the Elysian fields and took this combination of ergot and alcohol. They had uh, very interesting experiences, a lot of dancing, a lot of singing, a lot of chanting. And after a couple of weeks, they went back to their city-states with their minds sufficiently cleaned that they could then go and continue to do what the Greeks were quite good at, you know, like building democracy and writing plays we still put on today, little technical things like that, you know. And they believed that, the, that this combination of, of, of drugs was actually very helpful to their, their society. There's a more controversial aspect to drug use, and that's uh, 
That's the relationship particularly of the mascara, Amanita mascara, is in Christianity. Uh, there are people who believe, and you can make quite an interesting case, that the original apple tree was not an apple tree at all. It's pretty unlikely it was an apple tree because apples were invented uh, when Adam and Eve were around. You know, they'd be cultivated much later. And this is a fresco from a northern Europe, Italian church suggesting that the tree was actually Amanita muscaris. You see lots of examples of Amanita. This is from one of the most beautiful books on Christianity in the, um, the Church of Canterbury. Here you see Jesus blessing the mushrooms. And uh, you can make an arg a strong argument that Christian, the, the whole growth of Christianity, and hence this particular town, Christiania, was driven by the experiences of altered consciousness produced by the Amanita muscaris mushroom. But of course, the big breakthrough came with LSD. As Albert Hoffman had a hundred sitting in his uh, psychedelic house overlooking the lake. Uh, the house doesn't look like that. That's just, a, that's just an artist, like the artist over there. But he was a hundred. He used LSD most weeks for 60 years of his life. He didn't fry his brain. The first Brit, Briton to take LSD lived to 103. So um, I don't know if there's a relationship between longevity and use of LSD, but uh, some people might claim. It doesn't, certainly didn't fry their brains. Um, what it did do was open up this enormous avenue of research. And there was a lot of research done with those 140 US grants. People used it to study the effects of being ill, psychotic. It was used to help mental health professionals get a, a sympathy for their patients by having altered consciousness. It was used as psychotherapy to help people get over mental illness. And it was used to facilitate psychotherapy by loosening up the brain so that people were more receptive to psychotherapy. So massive use. And uh, because there was a lot of interest and people saw this as a real breakthrough. Here are a couple of Brits who used it. This is Ronald Lang, a very the enfant terrible in his day of psychiatrist, trying to revolutionize and destroy the old constructs of psychiatry. And Lang said this, he said, if you want to become a psychoanalyst, you need to do three things. Read the works of Freud, undergo personal analysis, and take LSD. <laughs> and Humphrey Osmond, the man that actually gave uh, LSD to um, Aldous Huxley back in the States, he said this, to sink in hell or soar angelic, you'll need a pinch of psychedelic. It's not great poetry, but it does make the case. <laughs> so in those 17 years when these drugs were available for research, 140 grants, 1,000 clinical papers, 40,000 patients, 40 books, six international conferences, and the results were actually generally pretty positive. <laughs> in fact, there were, I think, four hospitals in Denmark which did LSD therapy, and three of them thought it was really good, and one didn't think it was very good, but they put their patients down in the cellar and chained them to the beds, which was not a, nice, not a very psychotherapeutic way of doing LSD therapy. Here are just some overviews. I'm not going to go through them all. Huge numbers of people have been treated. Vast lots of outcomes have been studied. The rates of suicide are low. The rates of psychosis are low. They're probably lower than they are if you don't treat people. And overall, this was the conclusion from that vast body of research. Treatment with LSD is not without ad acute adverse reactions. Some people can have bad trips. But given adequate psychiatric supervision and proper conditions for its administration, the incidence of such reactions is not great. And basically what they're saying is that it's like most medicines. There's always a risk, but the benefit outweighs the risk. I just want to give you one rather powerful example of uh, how psychedelics changed a whole field of medicine uh, and how that opportunity was lost when the drugs were made illegal. So this is Bill Wilson. This is the man that founded Alcoholics Anonymous. Bill was an alcoholic from the age of 18, when he was a Yale undergraduate, to 33. And at 33, he was going through his last detoxification anticipating they were going to lock him up in an institution as an incurable inebriate for the rest of his life. And during that detoxification, they gave him atropine. Atropine is a powerful anticholinergic blocker. It produces profound hallucinations. And during that episode, Bill had a psychedelic experience, which I'll show you on the next slide. And as a result of that experience, 
he started seeking out psychedelic experiences. And in fact, he was the guy that, with Osman, gave LSD to Huxley. And this was his experience. So he said, suddenly the room lit up with a great white light. I was caught up in an ecstasy, which there are no words to describe. It seemed to me in my mind's eye that I was on a mountain, and there was a wind, not of air, but of spirit, blowing. And then it burst upon me that I was a free man, by which he means the shackles of his alcoholism were thrown off. He no longer wanted alcohol above all other things. He could see there was a life beyond alcohol. And in fact, he went on then to fund, or to persuade NIH to fund trials of LSD and alcoholism. In fact, six trials were done. And recently, a couple of Norwegians went back and got the original data from those six trials and put them through what we call a meta-analysis, a modern analysis of the um, statistical effects of these treatments. And these are the results. They were published in this journal, the Jay Farm, and they show the effect size of LSD to be almost two, one. An effect size of one is uh, a very strong effect size. LSD, and that's one or two treatments only, is a better treatment for alcoholism than anything we have today. Now, the last study was done in 1967, so we're looking at 50 years. And in those 50 years, I've estimated that conservatively, probably 150 million premature deaths from alcoholism. I mean, if LSD only helped 10% of people stop drinking, that's 15 million premature deaths you could have stopped. That's an amazing outcome. You know, that's, a, you know, that's the same number of deaths as from malaria. Why have we denied those 15 million people opportunity to be treated with a drug that might work? Well, the answer is because we were blind to its possibilities and because we still believed and we kept being told that the war on drugs was, was a necessity to protect ourselves and our young people against the ravages of drugs like LSD, which, of course, is actually ridiculous. As far as we know, there's no, been no reduction in the use of LSD as a result of the campaign against it. All that's happened is that we've stopped people who need it as a medicine from having treatment. But it's also worth reflecting on why the hysteria about psychedelics was so prominent. And it, this came before the Nixon war on drugs. This came as the first response to the Vietnam War. And basically, young American men who were being forced to go and fight in, in a country which they'd never heard of and didn't know where it was and didn't know what they were fighting for, they were just giving up on becoming soldiers. And they were going to San Francisco. They were taking acid, listening to the Grateful Dead, putting flowers in their hair, reading the works of this man, Timothy Leary. But most importantly, they were doing this. They were protesting against the war. LSD was seen as a major aspect of the anti-war movement. And <clears throat> America did not want an anti-war movement because war was what America did well, or it thought it did well. And so this was very, very threatening, and it had to be stopped. And I just want you to reflect on this. I kind of think, well, I wonder if we dropped acid in Syria instead of bombs. <laughs> we wouldn't have six million dispossessed people destroying the boundaries of Europe through their uh, efforts to escape. You know, maybe we should have to perhaps think differently about it. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe they had a point. And this, you could see why the Americans were scared, because if people didn't make bombs, then the American economy would struggle. But what's worse was that the banning of these drugs was done in opposition to the most powerful man in the world. This is Bobby Kennedy. He would have been president if he had been assassinated. So he's secretary of state for Johnson. And he's saying to his, his bureaucrats, he's saying, why if these projects were worthwhile six months ago, while well, we spent you know, a billion dollars studying LSD, why aren't they worthwhile now? We keep going around and around. He's been lied to by his bureaucrats. We're saying we've got to ban this drug because it's of no use. If I could get a flat answer about that, I'd be happy. Is there a misunderstanding? He knew he was being lied to, 
But he couldn't stop it. And then finally he says, I think perhaps we've lost sight of the fact that LSD can be very, very helpful in our society if used properly. Bureaucrats banned drugs. Even, as I say, the most powerful man in the world could not stop them. And they got banned, and they're still banned, and they might be banned forever unless we do something about it. And I would say, has there ever been a worse example of censorship in the history of the world? And scientific censorship? And I would say, probably not. But the nearest I can come up with uh, was a long time ago. It was actually in 1616 when the Catholic Church banned the writings of Copernicus. Now, that ban was effective for the same reasons as the ban on psychedelics. The church did not want to know the truth. It didn't want to know the truth that the earth was not the center of the universe. That ban lasted 150 years, but it only uh, was affected in Catholic countries. So the good news was for your guys, Tico Brahe, that you could carry on studying the skies because you weren't Catholics. The ban on psychedelics has lasted over 50 years. The research opportunities in neuroscience over 50 years are immensely greater than the research opportunities for astronomy back in the 1600s. There weren't that many astronomers. Uh, so in real terms, this is the worst censorship of research in the history of the world. And as you probably know, eventually the Enlightenment overturned the ban. The Enlightenment overturned the control that the Catholic Church and the other churches had on thinking in the Western world. And uh, some of the, here's some of the great pioneers of the Enlightenment. I just want to use this man, Voltaire, is the voice of the Enlightenment. And here's one of his many great quotes. Prejudices are what fools use for reason. And that is, that is what your drug laws and my drug laws are all based on. They're based on prejudice, not reason. Well, we've been fighting back, working with the Beckley Foundation and now with one or two other charities. And pleased to say, getting a small amount of money from my medical research council, we have started studying psychedelics. We've started studying MDMA, which has also been banned not for quite so long. And we started from the premise that if we know the science of these drugs, we can perhaps get better insights into their harms, but also perhaps get better understandings as to why they were seen back in the 50s and 60s as such enormously powerful potential treatments. So we began by doing imaging studies with magic mushrooms and then with LSD. And the results were stunning. I, this doesn't show very well on this, under this light, but what you see here are connection, connectivity diagrams in the brain uh, under control condition and under psilocybin. And um, there are the same number of connections in both of these images, 7,200 7, connections in both. In the normal brain, most of those connections are around the edge. That's what we call the small brain system. Your brain largely talks to the bits of the brain that are doing the same things as it's doing. So your visual cortex talks to your visual cortex, your auditory cortex talks to your auditory cortex. There's not a lot of cross-brain communication because that's actually how your brain has been taught to work over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years, however old you are. Under psychedelics, the small work constraints are broken down. The brain can talk much more freely. You can make connections across the brain that you've not ever made before, or certainly not since you were a baby. And it's those increased connections which allow people to see solutions to their problems, like, ah, maybe I don't need to be an alcoholic anymore. Maybe I can actually deal with my stress in a different way. That's psilocybin, here's the LSD. This is a similar, this is a different graphic, but showing the same kind of data. This is, the, this is what happens uh, under um, placebo. Your visual cortex is largely talking to itself a little bit of communication with the hippocampus here. Under LSD, your visual cortex is talking with everywhere in the brain, which is why when people are having trips with their eyes closed, they can see most remarkable and interesting and, and complicated visual scenes because all parts of the brain are linked to the visual cortex. So this increased connectivity gives us one way in which these drugs may help people overcome problems like depression and addiction because you can see alternative strategies, see new solutions. 
But also another fascinating thing came out of the psilocybin study. This looks at the areas of the brain which are turned off by psilocybin. And what was particularly of particular interest to us was this region here. This, this frontal region here is a part of the brain which is overactive in depression. It's called the subgenual cingulate cortex, for those of you who are interested in neuroanatomy. And we know that this region is switched off by many treatments for depression. In fact, it seems to be a necessary, it seems to be necessary to get over depression that this region is dampened down. Because all these different treatments do it. Even placebo, if you get better on placebo, this region is dampened down. What we could see was you know, within minutes of taking psilocybin, this region was also dampened down. And we thought, well, maybe, maybe switching off this region actually could mean that this drug could be useful in depression. And in fact, to support that, we had our own volunteers' comments. They'd come out of a scanner, and they'd still say, well, that was an interesting experience, and I still feel better. I mean, you know, most people don't take psilocybin in scanners, but even in the, those adverse circumstances, you can still get improvements in mood. But also in parallel, this group in John Hopkins, Bill Richards and Grodin Griffiths, were taking people who weren't mentally ill, but people who just wanted to experience a different aspect of life. And they were giving them psilocybin, uh, a single dose of psilocybin in a therapeutic setting, and finding that many of them thought it was a hugely profound experience, an enduring experience. Some of them said, five years later, this is one of the most profound experiences of my life, because I'm seeing things that I never saw before. So we thought, well, maybe, maybe there is some potential for psilocybin in depression. And there was a call, the British government put out a call for new treatments of, of mental illness uh, six years ago now. And we wrote a grant saying, could we use magic mushrooms to treat resistant depression? And to my amazement, we got it funded. And I think that's because depression is the number one cause of disability in the Western world, certainly in your country. Way more disabling than diabetes or cardiovascular disease. And, uh, but that was the easy thing. Getting the money was easy. Because getting ethical permission to study these drugs in patients was almost impossible. In the end, they wouldn't let us do a study, a, a proper study. They said we had to do a safety study. We had to give the, it, depressed people a single dose, and we had to monitor them for six months to make sure they didn't die. And then, if they, then we would be allowed to do a controlled trial. And no, matter, no argument from me would change that, even though I said, look, a million people a year in Britain take these drugs and no one's ever died. They said, no, but depressed people are different. <laughs> But that was easy compared with getting the drug. Only one place in the world makes this stuff because it's illegal. And making it costs a lot of money. And uh, eventually, 32 months into a 36-month grant, we got permission to start. So we were very late starting, but we, we eventually went on and finished it. The cost of each dose was £1,500. And that's because of all the regulations. You know, I mean, this... If you want to work with these psychedelic drugs, you know, you're treated like a drug dealer. I'm a doctor. I can write a prescription for heroin. But if I want to study psilocybin, if a special police check, a special safe, I've got to have a camera making sure that I'm not snorting it when I'm taking it out. And that's why it costs this much per dose. And, and I said to the, you know, the regulators, this, this seems a little excessive, really. And they said, well, we've got to protect the public from you doctors who might be selling it. And I said, at £1,500 a dose, not even in Chelsea am I going to get any takers for this. <laughs> just, yeah, it was a pain, but we did it. No one died, and a lot of people did rather well. So these are the, these are the mood scores, the black blobs are the mood scores, and all the coloured lines are the different individual changes in mood. So they all started off being resistant depression. They've all failed on at least two treatments. They've all failed on CBT. They've got reasonable depression scores, and a lot of them get almost completely cured for a few weeks. In fact, the mean change is a halving of the score, which lasts for up to five weeks. Now, that is a profound alteration in people who've got resistant depression, who failed on other treatments. Some of them stayed well for ages. Some of them slipped back. Some of them, as they were slipping back, went off and found psilocybin elsewhere, like in the Netherlands, and started having treatments because they thought it was so valuable here. But this is probably the most profound effect in resistant depression that's ever been shown. 
The problem I have now is that once a week, someone writes to me and says, can I have some? And I say, no, I can't use it because it's illegal still. So, um, we are, you know, years on from the study, we're still denying people access because the, to protect them from the dangers of the drug. The other interesting thing about it was the study dro was driven by the brain science of psilocybin. But we also did brain science during the trial. We asked, we put, basically, we took subjects and we put them into a scanner and we asked the question, was there amygdala changed as a result of the treatment? Now, this is a brain scanner. This is a brain. These little red blobs here are the amygdala. Either side of your brain in here, you've got two, two nuclei, two parts of the brain, which are exquisitely sensitive to threat. If someone said the word fire, your amygdala would immediately light up because the amygdala is what gets, gets you running away from threat. When you see someone who's looking frightened, your amygdala lights up and starts to orchestrate an escape because it, it's the part of the brain which is sensitive to anything that might harm you. So if you show people these pictures, the amygdala lights up. Now, what's interesting is that we, there's a lot of data that in depressed people, the amygdala is more sensitive. You show a depressed person an anxious or a frightened face, their amygdala lights up more. And the drugs we used up till now, the SSRIs, they dampen it down. That's the most profound effect. They, within a couple of days of going on an SSRI, your amygdala responses are dampened down. You find the world less threatening. So we did the study, and we looked at amygdala reactivity after psilocybin. And it was exactly the opposite. They had increased reactivity rather than decreased reactivity. Strange. But interestingly, when we look at happy faces, antidepressants have an unpredictable effect on happy faces, but psilocybin increased responses to happy faces. And we've now come up with a whole new theory of how you can lift depression. The traditional theory is antidepressants blunt negative emotions and then allow you to overcome the chronic stress of life by blunting its impact on you. Whereas psychedelics increase your reactivity, increase your engagement with your emotions, and we think they allow you to overcome depression by working it through. So rather than keeping away the bad things with psychedelics, you encounter them, you deal with them, and then you put them to bed. And that is a potentially very powerful alternative strategy to antidepressants. And here's an example of... Uh, of how that works. So this is a, a questionnaire we use on our patients, and we measure how pessimistic they are. And uh, before the treatment, our depressed patients show quite a s severe, a very significant pessimism bias. Basically, you ask them, what do they think about the world? And they say the world is a nasty, hostile, unpleasant place. Well, they're right, it is. There's no question about that except here perhaps in Christiania, but for the rest of the world, or maybe Denmark's not, but the rest of the world, it's a horrible place. But knowing that doesn't help you. What you need to do is you need to see the world as a much less hostile place like most of us do. You know, those of us who aren't depressed have what we call an optimism bias. And that's what happens with psychedelics. Psychedelics stop people being negative. And here's a lovely description of one of our patients and if you want to read, all the patient descriptions are in this publication. My outlook has changed significantly. I'm more aware now it's pointless to get wrapped up in endless negativity. I feel as if I've seen a much clearer picture. This was a very common kind of experience. People talked a lot about as if they had a reset to their brain, a reboot, that this endless negativity, the negative thinking that underpinned their depression was just shredded and they could actually see the world in a different way. So that's psilocybin. What about MDMA? Well, there's growing evidence that MDMA may be useful for PTSD. PTSD is the disorder of our time. I mean, no one who's lived in Aleppo, or actually almost anyone who's lived in Syria, could avoid being, having post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, the way they have been, their lives have been turned to rubble. We know that 40% of Rwandans still have PTSD. I presume all Syrians. The other really interesting thing is now, the wars we're fighting these days, and this will be true of your soldiers as well as American soldiers, 
more of soldiers kill themselves than are killed by the combatants. And that's because they never see the combatants, and mostly they get blown up. And they have no idea why they're doing it, what they're doing anyway. And, uh, and they know they can't win, so it's all a bit pointless. And then they come home and no one likes them, and so they kill themselves because they've got trauma. So what can we do about chronic traumatic disorder, PTSD? Well, there's a very nice, very powerful, important study done by the Mitthoffers a few years ago. They took people with severe PTSD that failed two other treatments, and they gave them two sessions of psychotherapy for trauma psychotherapy plus MDMA, ecstasy. And they showed profound improvements in their PTSD at two months, which continued up to four years. This is a revolutionary treatment for chronic PTSD. They've replicated that now in a separate group of, uh, of people published just two weeks ago. So MDMA therapy, two sessions under MDMA, can help people get over PTSD. The question to us was, how does it work? I could not get funding to study MDMA. If I went to research councils or the Wellcome Trust, they said, oh, no, we can't touch that because that's a recreational drug. And I'd say, but it was a medicine. Ah, oh, no, but if you use that in a research study, you're encouraging people to use it recreationally, which is absurd, but that's the way it was. In fact, in the end, I had to get a TV company to fund the study because no, uh, none of the normal funders had the courage to fund this work. But the TV program did. There's Jon Snow, the presenter. Uh, it's probably the only major scientific study that's ever been funded by a TV company. But it was a remarkable study, because during that study, we did the first ever proper brain imaging of MDMA. But we also did it in the context of memory. So we asked people, when they were in the scanner, under MDMA or under placebo, to relive memories that they had previously written down. We didn't know what the memories were. We had code words so that they could remember that particular memory. We didn't want to know the memories. And they relived them in the scanner. And what we found was this. We found that positive memories, they had three positive memories uh, under each condition. Positive memories were enhanced by MDMA, which of course is why people take it. But negative memories were dampened down by MDMA. And that we think this is important because the big challenge with treating PTSD is that you have to get people to relive the memory and overcome the emotion that is accompanied by the memory. You know, they've got to remember being blown up, but they've got to stop the overwhelming emotion and fear. And that way they can then live their lives without being swamped by emotion on a daily basis. MDMA, by dampening down these negative memories, uh, we thought this is the first pointer to how it might work in PTSD. And then we went on, oh shoot, sorry. Uh, we went on, under, underneath here you see the imaging study that shows the, the impact of um, MDMA to dampen down the amygdala and hippocampal responses to the trauma. So not only did we get attenuation of the traumatic memory, but we also managed to, we showed where in the brain that was happening. And because of that, we've now got funding. And three weeks ago, we started the first UK study where we're treating people with chronic alcoholism who are drinking to deal with childhood trauma. We're treating their trauma with MDMA and we're going to find out whether by doing that they can stop self-medicating with alcohol. So that study will run for the next couple of years and if it works it could be a revolutionary new way of dealing with the large proportion of alcoholics who are actually dealing to deaden the pain of their lives. So I'll finish now. This George Bernard Shaw was a famous playwright, philosopher, one of the first socialists. And he said this, those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. And I do hope that my talk has helped some of you change your minds. And more importantly, please use the data in this talk to help change the minds of your parents and your grandparents and all the politicians that carry on pretending that a world that fights a war against drugs is a better world than a world that actually learns to use them appropriately. Thank you very much.